I think it's backwards though. To me, it's backwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the staircase should be on this side. So I'm, I'm not sure how to fix that, but anyway, you can see the entrance. And I'm not actually there. I am in my house uh, with that virtually behind me. I'm uh, very glad that you all can do a Zoom call with us today. We've been doing a lot of Google Meets with our classrooms because the schools aren't allowed to use Zoom. Um, but it seems like we have a lot more freedom with the, the Zoom. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen, I think. Uh, let's see. Okay. I can still see you. That That's different than, uh, than Google. Go. I've been doing the, the Google thing, so I haven't been able to uh, to see my audience. So this is quite nice. So um, I will just get started. Uh, okay, it's my little tab is covered up up here. I don't know how to move this thing. Oh, that muted me. Let me see. Well, okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, welcome to Mammoth Cave National Park. My name is Ranger Mariah. I am a uh, interpretive park ranger at Mammoth Cave and also I do environmental education programs. So we are very happy to be able to join you all virtually. I know that it would be impossible for some of you to get down here to Kentucky even without COVID to see Mammoth Cave. So this is a wonderful opportunity. I think uh, COVID unfortunately has limited us in a lot of the things that we get to do uh, that we were used to doing before, but it's also opened up many uh, new avenues to reach people that we were unable to reach in the past. And uh, hopefully those things will continue. So I'm glad you all get to join me today on this virtual tour or uh, experience through this amazing underground world that we call Mammoth Cave. Um, it, we are located in South Central Kentucky in if I thought about it, I would have put a map on here so you could see where we are. Uh, I will I will improve this for next time. I wasn't really thinking about you all being up, up so far north. But uh, the, the way Mammoth Cave got started and the whole uh, Kentucky region that we are in, it was once a warm, shallow sea. And this sea had many creatures living in it, like sharks and uh, lots of... Uh, cryonoids, which were, were little sea creatures, kind of like coral. Uh, there were lots of different corals, lots of animals living in this warm ocean environment. And as time went on, those sea creatures died, uh, fell down to the sea floor, and the sea eventually receded, leaving behind all of those creatures that layered together and compacted to make the uh, layers of rock that we have today that make up Mammoth Cave. We have a very thick layer of limestone. You can see that down at the bottom. Let me get my pointer. I'm pointing with my finger. I guess you can't see that. <laughs> so we have this very thick layer of limestone rock. Limestone is a calcium carbonate rock. It is made up of all those little tiny creatures that lived in the ocean a long time ago um, that left behind their deposits and that limestone layer dissolves very easily when a carbonic acid, a weak carbonic acid comes in contact with it. But over the top of us we have this layer of sandstone. Sandstone is a much harder rock. Um, it does flake away or weather easily. If you rub it, it's uh, very sandy and it, it flakes away. But water doesn't dissolve that rock. So it makes a really good roof over our cave. And that's why we are a cave instead of a big canyon like the Grand Canyon out west. We have this sandstone and shell cap rock that protects our limestone layer. When water drips through, it carves out just the places that it's touching. It doesn't carve out the whole 
um, limestone area. And it is caused by weathering and erosion. So whenever it rains, let me move you all over so I can see my slide. <laughs> Um, and hopefully you all can see the slide. I know I had I had part of it covered up with your pictures, so you all may need to adjust your screens if you can't see everything. But whenever it rains, that rain uh, collects some, some carbonic acid. It's kind of like a soda pop. If you've ever had soda pop in your mouth, it feels kind of fizzy. That acid is what's making those bubbles and that fizz and when that comes into contact with the cave environment it starts carving out that limestone and removing that um, rock material making all of these voids we've got pits where the water comes down and then these open passageways where a river flowed through this underground world at one time and what makes Kentucky so special and so able to make all of these caves? We have a great sinkhole plain. You see all these little holes? It's kind of like a, a golf ball with all the little divots in it. And it's called a karst landscape with sinkholes, caves, and underground streams or losing streams, the streams on the surface that just disappear into that underground world. And all of that water is trying to get to the lowest point at the um, water table, which right now is at the uh, level of the Green River, which is a big river that flows through our park. And the underground rivers in the cave are at that level as well. And that's where caves are still being formed in Mammoth Cave. So this word karst is a Yugoslavian word that means rocky land. And the cave is just a fantastic place to visit. There's always something new to find and explore. It's full of these domes. You can see this little man down here and how huge this cave is. These huge domes and pits. So wherever there's a dome, there's usually a pit. We call the domes when you're looking up what you see, and if you're looking down, it's a pit. And then we have some very unique places. And this is one of the reasons that we can't show most of the cave right now. This area of the cave is called Fat Man's Misery. So this is one of our videos. We're going to cross our fingers that it works. So let me click on it and see. And it may not. I may have to turn my pointer off. Hi, I'm Ranger Ashley. Below Booth's Amphitheater, 264 feet beneath your feet is Fat Man's Misery. Described by an 1866 visitor as a torturous rift, a snake in convolution, and an avenue of torture in ruggedness, narrowness, and lowness. It would perplex a groundhog. In spite of, or because of, its ruggedness, narrowness, and lowness, Fat Man's Misery is one of the most asked about popular passages in the cave. No groundhogs were perplexed in this area. <laughs> so, uh, Fat Man's Misery is just one of the areas where you have to kind of twist and turn and duck, especially if you're very tall at all. Uh, you have to duck to get through this area of the cave. Uh, we've been down there since we've quit doing cave tours and it's quite wet right now. I think we just don't realize when we have so many people going through that area how much moisture their um, clothing absorbs while they're in there. So it, it's got all of these little uh, holes and stuff have, have water hanging out in them right now. So the cave environment has changed a little bit since people are not going through. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if our scientists have done some research on some of the animals to see if they've uh, changed their way of using the cave since we're not in most of it right now. Hi, I'm Ray. And then we have some bigger, uh, wider open areas of the cave. This is the main cave on the left here. This is called Broadway. It leads down from the historic entrance into our main part of the cave. This is what most of the upper level of Mammoth Cave looks like. It's a very dry cave. 
It has formed these um, archways, a natural arch. So the walls are actually pushing in, holding up the ceiling of the cave. So it's a very stable environment. But you can see a long time ago, it wasn't very stable. So when water was flowing through here, as that water left the passageway, it wasn't holding up those loose rocks anymore. So any loose rocks fell away at that time, and that is still left in the cave. One of the biggest questions we get from visitors is how much of this cave was, was man-made or carved out or blasted. None of this cave was carved out or blasted by man. It was all created by water. Now we do have about 27 different entrances into the Mammoth Cave system itself. A lot of those have been opened up by man. They were opened up with um, blasting materials or, or some way that man could expand those openings. They felt some cold air coming out quite often and knew that it could be a place that you could, could find a cave. So back before this was a national park, there were a lot of people with um, land ownership around that wanted to discover a way into Mammoth Cave. <clears throat> so that's when a lot of the, uh, the man-made entrances um, were made. This picture on the right is a really interesting part of the cave, one of the most visited parts of the cave in the 1800s. This is an upper level of the cave just off of this Broadway Avenue called um, Gothic Avenue. And you can see by the dripstone formations, these redeposited rocks, that this is a very uh, old area of the cave. It's not very wet looking. It's, a, it's still a dry area of the cave, but at one time it was wet and these dripstone formations um, grew in the cave. This is called the Bridal Altar. And I have another video from Miss Ashley. Got to turn my pointer off. Hi, I'm Ranger Ashley. In the 1800s and 1900s, several couples got married 154 feet beneath your feet in Gothic Avenue at a dripstone formation known as the Bridal Altar. According to an 1800 story, a bride who swore to her mother to never marry any man on the face of the earth kept her promise by marrying her love inside Mammoth Cave under the earth. Weddings are no longer held in the cave, but subterranean wedding proposals are still known to happen. Hi. I just love all those stories about Mammoth Cave. Uh, Mammoth Cave has such a rich history and there have been lots of books written. Uh, since we're talking to library patrons, I know you all love books. I love books. I love our library. Um, and books take us to a world that we've we've never been to before and they can open up places uh, that we we may have thought we knew about, but we see them in someone else's eyes. So um, there there have been some very eloquent books written about Mammoth Cave or stories that people have way back as far as the 1800s. But we have lots of beauty to explore as well. We have these lovely dripstone formations on our left. These are just simply redeposited calcium carb carbonate uh, formations. That is that redeposited limestone that was dissolved in layers of rock above came into these open cave passageways and regrew as these beautiful dripstone formations. Most of you probably know the ones that are sticking tight to the ceiling are called stalactites with a C for ceiling. And the ones that are coming up from the ground are stalagmites with a G for ground. And then this lovely formation on the right is a special formation that grows in Mammoth Cave in drier cave passageways called gypsum. And gypsum grows out in these flower petal like formations. It can grow into really big, beautiful flowers. Um, a lot of what was growing in Mammoth Cave in his historic entrance was removed by prehistoric people over 5,000 years ago. And back to our historic entrance, this is the first room that you come to when you enter Mammoth Cave through the historic entrance. This is called the Rotunda. And the Rotunda is very rich in history. 
Uh, we have the saltpeter mining works that are located in this room and on back about another half mile into the cave. The uh, saltpeter mining took place in the early 1800s and it was one of the first uses of Mammoth Cave by modern man. They discovered that the dirt was very rich in potassium nitrate, which is a key ingredient for gunpowder. The potassium nitrate was uh, leached out of the dirt by placing the dirt into these vats, these wooden bins that the, the dirt was collected mainly by uh, slave miners deep inside the cave. They went back as far as two miles into the cave, brought the dirt back up to these mining uh, locations. And then, let me get my pointer again. Uh, the water was brought into the cave through a series of these tulip poplar logs that had been carved out in the middle. They are very long uh, trees, very straight trees. It's actually Kentucky State tree and they uh, grow very fast and very tall and straight. They're soft in the middle so it was easy to carve out that that hole with a long spoon bit auger but they did that all by hand all of this mining work was done by hand. And it was when uh, Kentucky played a vital role in helping the United States win the War of 1812 by providing this saltpeter for gunpowder. So Mammoth Cave was uh, very important in that process. So now we've got Ranger Mary, who's gonna tell us a little bit about the Rotunda Room. an anonymous man stood in awe of the giant cave chamber now called Rotunda, 141 feet beneath your feet. The chamber's huge size inspired him to call the whole cave the Mammoth Cave, and the name stuck. The chamber itself, originally called the Big Room, became known as Rotunda for its round ceiling. Rotunda is the sixth largest, largest room in Mammoth Cave, roughly 140 feet wide and 40 feet from floor to ceiling. So it's really interesting that we know how deep we are in most of Mammoth Cave. They know that by doing surveys. Uh, Mammoth Cave has been surveyed uh, for, gosh, probably 60, 70 years. They've been mapping and surveying this cave on the surface and below, maybe even further back than that. Um, but records that we have go back that far. We have a group called the Cave Research Foundation that continues to explore our cave and map more passageways, hoping to make Mammoth Cave even longer than it is today. And it, it probably is, we just haven't found it yet. But it's interesting, she, a lot of these videos have mentioned how deep we are. This is, these videos are from a little surface tour that correlates to uh, the below ground, what would be below you. So as you walk around on the surface at Mammoth Cave, you can find these signs that tell you what's underneath your feet. And this room, the rotunda room, is actually right underneath the hotel at Mammoth Cave. So it's pretty interesting to be able to make that connection. So Mammoth Cave has been used by modern people since the late 1700s. And then before that, prehistoric people were exploring Mammoth Cave. We have lots of evidence that they left behind like these grass slippers. They left behind cane reed torches like you see over here in front of this lantern. Uh, that is how they lit their way into Mammoth Cave to see in that complete and total darkness. They had to be pretty interested in what they were going to find underground to be able to go in there with very little light, a very unreliable light source because a wooden torch could blow out any time. There are accounts of these lanterns, these early lanterns that guides and explorers used and um, visitors used when they were going in as they would go down the steps into the historic entrance in the winter time 
we uh, get that cold air being sucked into the cave. And in the summertime, that cold air is blowing out of the cave because the outside temperature regulates how the, the cave breathes. So that you've always got this tunnel effect of wind blowing in and out of the historic entrance. So when you go down with an open flame like that with nothing around it, your flame's gonna go out. So just as long as you know that's gonna happen, you're not gonna be scared. But if you didn't know that was gonna happen, and, and a lot of guides wouldn't tell their visitors this, it was part of the experience of Mammoth Cave. You would be going down your steps and then all of a sudden you're in complete and total darkness. That would be a little bit of a scary experience. But this was the lantern that was used uh, up until the, the early 1900s when you visited Mammoth Cave. So Mammoth Cave has been toured by visitors for over 200 years. We have this rich history um, of people visiting the, the National Park before it was even a national park. And a lot of those early guides were slaves. We, uh, we would not know what we know today without some of these early explorers that were fearless in uh, how they explored Mammoth Cave with just that open flame lantern to uh, lead their way and to lead them down into some of the darkest, most unknown places. But some of the early visitors, it's interesting to look at the clothing that they wore. These ladies, they wore their high heel shoes and their dresses and they explored into these deep, dark passageways. And today there's no end in sight. We still know that there is more cave to find down there. We just haven't found it all yet. And this, this is one of our Cave Research Foundation members. You can see it's kind of a dirty process to go into these areas of the cave. It's good to be a teeny tiny person also to get into some of these places that they're exploring. Just recently this summer, um, I have a friend that's uh, one of the Cave Research Foundation members. They found about two or three hundred more feet of cave, but she is a teeny tiny person and they had to crawl through some, some small areas to get there. But we also have lots of things on the surface. It's not just underneath our feet that we like to share with our visitors at Mammoth Cave. We do have some amazing places and down as far as the Echo River where those cave formate or caves are still being carved out, uh, you can go as deep as 360 feet below the surface to the water table underneath the, uh, the cave. But we also have these beautiful views and lots of trails to explore as well on the surface in the 52,000 acres of Mammoth Cave National Park. So we've got another video that tells you about a cool place in the cave. Hi, I'm Ranger Mary. River Hall lies 283 feet beneath your feet on the historic tour route. Usually dry, this passage fills with water. The Mammoth Cave's River Styx floods into it. Most of the cave stays dry during floods. River Hall is the only toured section of the cave in the floodplain. Poet and abolitionist Lydia Maria Child wrote of River Hall when visiting Mammoth Cave. The River Hall descends like the slope of a mountain. The ceiling stretches away, away before you, vast and grand as the firmament at midnight. Hi. I so not only do we have the magnificent caves under our feet, we have miles of river for your pleasure and a working ferry. There's not many places in the country where you can still ride a ferry across a river, but Mammoth Cave has one. There are trails that lead to waterfalls and trails that show off nature's splendid beauty. We can find wildflowers any time of year along our trails at Mammoth Cave. We have short trails that can take you to some of the most iconic places in the park. This is Sloan's Pond on the right. You can always find some kind of critter to see there. Lots of frogs hang out in this pond. Owls like to hunt at night and find fish. Uh, we have great blue herons and lots of other animals. And this is where the underground river comes out of the cave at Echo River Spring. There's a 
beautiful accessible trail that goes around the top of the spring and all the way down to the bottom of it. These are some other trails that we have in the park. Uh, Green River Bluffs Trail can take you throughout the park and lead you into all of these other trails. And just a couple of books that I would recommend if you all are interested in learning more about Mammoth Cave. These are some books that uh, we use with our school groups that come to visit. Journey to the Bottomless Pit tells about Stephen Bishop, the first guide to ever cross into uh, the deeper parts of the cave. He crossed a bottomless pit, the, one of the deeper pits, on a wooden ladder or a wooden pole, we're not really sure what he used, holding his lantern in his teeth as he crossed that. So this story is pretty uh, amazing. And then the City of Amber is a series, it's a fictional series, but it's kind of based on places in Mammoth Cave. The, the writer did a phenomenal job researching Mammoth Cave and talking, describing some of the areas that the, uh, the City of Amber or Ember is uh, located in. So pretty fantastic books. There's lots of other books out there as well. But I thank you all for listening to me today and I'm gonna open it up for some questions now. So if you all are ready to unmute, I hope you've learned a little bit about Mammoth Cave and what we have to explore. All right, if you wouldn't mind ending the screen share, that might help a little bit. Okay. There we go. There we go, cool. So did, did everything work okay? The videos, you could hear them and- Perfect. Um, I'm so excited. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Ray, this is Abby, say hi. Uh, hi. Um, so hi. I say in the last part of your presentation that we've still not found all the, the parts of the cave yet, is that because of physical limitation and because of maybe even not allowing people to be in certain parts of the cave at parts of the year or times of the history of it? No, our Cave Research uh, Foundation group can go into pretty much any area of the cave. Um, and they, they are continuing to, to try to reach further. It's just that there may not be a, a way for a human to fit through right now <laughs> into yeah. certain parts of the cave that would expand it. The last big um, expedition that made a, a huge connection was in 1972, I believe they connected another cave system to the Mammoth Cave system and made it, um, gosh, did it go up? I think it went from 200 and some miles to oh. over 300 overnight. And then there was another big one that added 60 miles overnight just by making one connection. So they're, they're, they just never know when they're gonna find that place. There's just so many places to, to look and explore. Mammoth Cave right now, we know there are about five different levels of cave. Let me get my hat. So it's kind of like this hat. If the, the little ridges on my hat were the different layers of cave, we'd have about five or six different layers of cave right now that we, we know of. The lowest level would be where the water table is, where those rivers are flowing. And then up here is the historic entrance right behind me. And uh, between that, there's just so much cave. Now it's all located within about the, the 60 square miles of Mammoth Cave National Park. And it's all compacted in this area. It doesn't, it's not linear. We couldn't get to Indiana or Illinois <laughs> by uh, traveling underground. So it's all connected and piled on top of each other. Oh, that's so Have they ever considered using something like robots and cameras and things to do any of that? They have gone in uh, to our springs with some of those underwater um, robots. What do they call those? Rovers or something? They lost one and had to retrieve it. Uh, but it was um, As, uh, it was a high school group that that did this. They uh, it was like a science club or something that came yeah. a few years ago. So yeah, they're they're using technology now, trying to to learn more about it. I I haven't been, of course, down to the the water table under in the cave. You have to be pretty uh, advanced to be able to do that. But uh, they say that some of those underground passageways that are full of water are as big as the, the main big 
cave passageways that we walk through all the time. So it's pretty amazing. When the water table drops, we'll have more cave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you tell us a little bit about, oh, sorry. No, she was just talking. Yes, she's good. Thank you very much. Yes. I was just going to say, um, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the animal life in the caves? Oh, I left that out of my slideshow, didn't I? I need to add that too. Uh, yes, we have uh, lots of really interesting animals in the cave. Let me write that down though. Add animals. <laughs> um, we have bats, of course, that, that use the cave. They go in and out. They, they like to find food outside of the cave, so they can't live in the cave all the time. We see lots of salamanders in some of our wetter parts of the cave. Those are also in and out animals that, that live in the cave part of the time and outside part of the time. Lots of bugs. Cr cave crickets are our most common thing. It is a, a pretty big cricket. A lot of people think it looks like a spider because it has these long antenna and then their long legs, but it's a cricket, um, also called the camelback cricket. And you will probably have those up, up where you all live and you might find them in your basement or cellar. Um, but down in our rivers, we have some of the most amazing and special animals. We have these animals that have adapted to the total darkness. They never leave the cave. They are eyeless fish. They have eyes, but they uh, have lost the ability to use them. So they've grown skin over their eyes because they don't need them anymore. And that would just take up some of their energy. So they, they don't have eyes pretty much. Uh, you can see through their body because they've lost the coloration to their skin. There are the little fish, also shrimp that are eyeless and, and transparent pretty much and then some salamanders that live in those underground streams as well so thanks for reminding me about that <laughs> there's so much to talk about at mammoth cave oh, yeah. we could we could do a, a special program on each subject anybody want to you can type uh questions into the chat or you can unmute yourself and talk mm -hmm. I haven't even looked at chat. Let me open that up if anyone Don't has see. questions. Oh. What kind of flowers can you find in the winter? Ooh, I haven't really hiked in the winter in a while. I am actually from this area. Um, I grew up in Barron County, right where Mammoth Cave is, but I moved away for about 20 years and now I'm back. I'm really thrilled to be back. Uh, I've moved into my great grandparents' house that and we bought the farm that borders Mammoth Cave. So I'm back home, but I haven't been on a winter hike uh, since before I left. So I'm trying to think what kind of flowers we will have this winter. I just don't know for sure. You know, most of all of my hikes have been in the summer and early spring. Now that it's starting to be fall though, I'm very excited. The weather is, is turning, uh, perfect for being outdoors. Not as many ticks. Hopefully the poison ivy will go away soon. <laughs> but I'll have to look up what kind of flowers we have in the winter. I have a, a good flower book about Mammoth Cave, but I don't have it behind me. Any other questions? If not, what's your favorite part of the cave? What's the favorite, what's the best part to go walking through? Well, you know, any part of the cave is amazing and beautiful in it of itself, but my favorite tour, and we're not offering it right now, is the Violet City Lantern Tour. I just think it's amazing to see that part of the cave by lantern light. Um, if you remember from the video, we showed the rotunda room which is the sixth largest room in the cave. And it is an enormous room, but on the Violet City Lantern Tour, you go through the largest room in the cave, which is about the size of two football fields. So it's amazing just to be in that uh, historic part of the cave, seeing it by lantern light. It's just an, an awe-inspiring experience. I think Joe's got a question on what the eyeless fish is called. There it, well, hmm, what is it called? 
I think it's just called a cave fish. Now there's a, a Kentucky cave shrimp and the only place that they've ever found it is in Mammoth Cave. But I'm not sure if the fish is called the Kentucky cave fish. I think it's just called a cave fish. Y'all have got some tough questions for me. I need to do more research. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Um, if you guys don't mind, I will unmute everybody so we can say thank you to um, Ranger Mariah. Let's call to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you right, all thank for joining you. me today. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, please join us for our other programs later this week. Bye. Bye. Thank hey. you. You all enjoy the fall. I think today's the first day of fall. Yep. That's exciting. <laughs> it's my favorite time of year. Bye. Bye.